Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Uh, on the 26th to the 28th of April of this year, the first Nobel Prize Summit will bring together Nobel Prize laureates, scientists, policymakers, business leaders, and youth leaders to explore the question, what can be achieved in this decade to put the world on a path to a more sustainable, more prosperous future for all of humanity? Ahead of the Nobel Prize Summit, a number of webinars that take a look at the summit themes will be organized, uh, such as today webinar on uh, ensuring a thriving ocean economy for everyone. The Nobel Prize Summit is hosted by the Nobel Foundation and it's organized by the National Academy of Sciences in the US in partnership with the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, the Stockholm Resilience Center at Stockholm University and the Bayer Institute. My name is Henrik Österblom. I'm a professor of environmental science at Stockholm Resilience Center. And it's my great pleasure and privilege to introduce you to this webinar. During this webinar, you will hear uh, presentations from uh, Vidar Helgesen, who is an executive director for the Nobel Foundation and who played an instrumental part in uh, working with the High Level Panel for Sustainable Ocean Economy, a major policy initiative uh, that's recently presented its findings. You will be hearing from Professor Enrique Sala. He is a founder of Pristine Seas uh, at the National Geographic. You will also hear from Professor Rashid Sumaila at the Institute for Ocean and Fisheries at the University of British Columbia. From Assistant Professor Beatrice Krona at the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and my colleague at the Stockholm Resilience Center and from Professor Elke Weber, who is a professor at the Department of Psychology at Princeton University. And this meeting will be moderated by Maria Damanaki, who is a former EU commissioner, who's played an instrumental part in shaping the policies associated to the ocean in the European community, and who is principal uh, advisor to Systemic currently. So with that, thank you all for participating. Thank you for tuning into this seminar and welcome and over to you, Maria. Thank you, thank you very much, Henry. Um, on behalf of the whole panel, I would like to thank the Nobel Foundation for having us here, for organizing this. This is really a great opportunity for all of us. I would like also to thank all of you who are attending. I hope you are all safe and well during these difficult times. And I hope that we are going to have an interesting, productive, and why not? pleasant discussion. And I can say that I hope because we have a great team, as you have heard, I can say that uh, we have global leaders really well known worldwide. And I hope that we can do our best uh, to keep you with us. So I don't want to preempt any of the discussion that is going to be right here after a few minutes. But I would like to focus on three questions that perhaps has, have crossed over your minds since you received this invitation. So my questions are, why oceans? Why now? And how we can do it in a practical, achievable, and cost-effective way? First, why oceans? So guys, I know I'm speaking to ocean lovers. So I don't have to persuade you about the importance of ocean. We all know that ocean covers the majority of our blue planet. We all know that ocean is the lung of humanity. Every second breath we are taking is coming from the ocean. Ocean is uh, our last frontier, our destiny. We all come from the ocean and we are going at the end to the ocean after we die is our last adventure, our last opportunity, but also our last big, big responsibility. I think that I have to focus on a new idea that emerged uh, during the last five years. For all of us, ocean is not a victim anymore. Ocean is a solution, is a great opportunity. Ocean is a solution not only to its own biodiversity and health, if we treat it correctly, but also ocean is a big solution for humanity's problems. Ocean can be a very, very big contribution to climate change tackling. Ocean panel actually proved 
that 25% of the Paris Agreement can come from the ocean, ocean actions. Ocean can be a solution to our food problem. President uh, John Kerry, Secretary John Kerry recently uh, said that we can have from the ocean 50% of the food we need. So think of the ocean in a positive way, ocean as a solution. Why now? We are at a critical moment. There is uh, an increasing interest about uh, the ocean from a, a lot of different parts of interest. First, science and uh, intelligence and technology. They have given us great solutions during the last decade. Quantum leaps we have seen. We have satellites, we have monitors, we have solutions, we have tools, we have models, we have everything. We have knowledge. Also, the finance community is paying a lot of attention to ocean. The recent Economist Ocean Summit proved that there is an increasing interest, appetite for blue investment. This comes with great opportunities for humanity, but also with some challenges, of course. And then there is an interest from policymakers. 2021 will be the year for oceans. At least this is what we, we hope for. So many important decisions were delayed because of COVID pandemic. So during 2021, we are going to have the Paris Agreement new summit in Glasgow. We are going to have the biodiversity big uh, conference in China. We are going to have negotiations for high seas treaties and uh, sea mining in the United Nations, in New York. We are going to have uh, uh, also uh, the WTO, new negotiations for fishery subsidies. And of course, we are running through the ocean decade for science. So ocean can be a protagonist a champion for 2021. How we can do it? We have to do it based on science. Science comes first. Of course, science comes first if we are talking in this environment of Nobel Foundation, but science comes first everywhere now. I think that we all have taken a good lesson from pandemic. So the decisions of policymakers have to be based on science and knowledge. But science is not enough. We need smart tools, innovative tools, financial tools, policy tools to leverage the good, the good uh, intentions for the ocean. And also we need some political will on the table. Political will is very important. We need policy and policy strength for discussions and decisions that have to be implemented in order to follow the right path. All this we are going to discuss with great guys, as already mentioned. So with other further ado, I'm turning to Vidar. Vidar can give us the big picture. He's attending a lot of meetings, just came out of Africa. So he's traveling. He's a lucky guy. So Vidar, up to you. Well, that Africa trip was digital as well, but... Uh... Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you disappointed me, Vida, now. Now, um, participants may ask why uh, an executive director of the Nobel Foundation would talk about the ocean. Uh, and uh, obviously my life immediately prior to taking up this role was one of um, leading the charge on behalf of the Norwegian Prime Minister with a high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy. Um, but through that process, I also learned the incredible importance of a close interplay between science and policy. We had a great deal of world leading experts providing input that prepared the basis for the policy discussions. And um, my topic for today is how the ocean is gathering political momentum, and it certainly is. And I will focus on five points or make five points in this regard. Uh, the first point, is that the ocean is gathering political momentum because of the problems the ocean is facing. This is obviously most visible and most politically clear in the case of plastic pollution, which has gathered the, uh, taken the political stage and, and captured the imagination of uh, populations, electorates and politicians uh, globally. 
but we also see increasingly the concern about the impact of climate change on the ocean, which is obviously a, a really big issue and arguably bigger than plastic. Um, we're seeing extreme weather caused by uh, where the ocean is playing a key role. We're seeing sea level rise. We're seeing acidification and heating of oceans already having an effect on ecosystems. Uh, adding to that, of course, the biodiversity challenges exacerbated as well by overfishing, illegal fishing, etc. Now, these problems, and many of these problems, not to say most of these problems, are caused by what politicians normally see as opportunities, economic opportunities, opportunities for job creation. And uh, that's where a point made already by Maria is my second point. There are opportunities within the ocean economy for win-wins. There are opportunities for ocean industries to be a major part of the solutions. Many of them are part of the problems today and they can really become part of the, pollution, or of the solutions. Um, fish and seafood, there is an opportunity if better managed and sustainably managed to produce way more fish and seafood, which is obviously protein of a much more planet-friendly variety than proteins produced on land. Decarbonizing shipping, uh, which is uh, incredibly important to the world economy uh, for trade routes. If we decarbonize that through electrification, hydrogen, ammonia, uh, that will add uh, both jobs and a better climate. The potential for producing clean energy at sea instead of fossil energy at sea is immense, particularly with regard to offshore wind, which can be scaled up 40 to 50 times. And uh, but also uh, ocean solar and other yet not fully explored uh, avenues of uh, clean energy production. And then there's nature itself. There's the blue forest. There is mangrove. There is uh, seaweed. We're seeing a, a rise in, in, the, in the interest um, among industries uh, for what we can call the seaweed revolution. Um, Maria and I are both involved in, in something called the sea, Seaweed for Europe, and we're really seeing how momentum is growing in that regard. So there are tremendous opportunities for win-win solutions. My third point um, is that both the problems and the opportunities are intertwined, interlinked, and dynamic. The problems are interacting, uh, they're adding up, they're cumulative, uh, contributing to ever faster changes of, of ecosystems. But the opportunities are also interacting. They're literally competing for space, competing for ocean space. And they're also competing for the carrying capacity of the ocean, because if left unregulated, the growth in ocean industries will not be sustainable. Uh, and because of these interlinkages, uh, there are a couple of needs which will make up my two last points. Uh, the fourth point is the need for knowledge and the need for ongoing continuous dialogue between science and policy. We see with these dynamic changes taking place um, that uh, whatever policy measures are, are put in place will need to be put in place quickly and at scale. And some of these policy measures might need to be corrected might prove to be not as good as we thought. And therefore that uh, continuous knowledge policy dialogue is absolutely uh, critical. If we are to rescue ecosystems, if we are to understand how they're changing, uh, and if we are to regulate and calibrate ocean-based industries in the right way. And finally, if we are to do all that based on knowledge, we need to manage and govern oceans across sectors. Today, in too many countries around the world and in too many ocean territories, ocean industries are left through their own devices. They might be regulated by a sector ministry or a sector, sector authority. But uh, if industries go forward sector by sector, there's no way we're going to be able to secure health, the health of the ocean. So we need integrated, coher coherent and uh, comprehensive governance of ocean territories. And this was the main commitment undertaken by the high-level panel uh, of, for a sustainable ocean economy. 
behind the panel are 14 countries, which is not a high number, but they do represent about 30% of the world's exclusive economic zones and about almost 40% of the world's coastlines. And they have committed to themselves uh, putting in place management frameworks for 100% of their national ocean jurisdictions and, um, uh, and calling on all other ocean states to do the same thing. And that's an important basis for uh, ensuring that we take better care of the ecosystems, that we ensure the regenerative capacity of the ocean, and that we ensure that ocean activity jobs and economic opportunity in the in the ocean economy uh, is taking place in a sustainable manner. I'm, I've left that work now. I still take a great interest in the science policy uh, dialogue, uh, but I'm also happy to report that I'm picking up that these 14 countries are experiencing a great interest from other major ocean states in this concept, uh, adding to the my point and adding to the headline for my intervention, policy momentum, political momentum is gathering for the ocean and the science policy dialogue is absolutely essential for that political momentum to be carried out and managed in a sustainable manner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vidar. Thank you uh, for the great job in the high level panel. So we have this great commitment to 100% sustainable ocean management for 30% of the ocean. Really good. So I'm turning now to Eric Sala. We are very, very willing and eager to hear about his new study. Eric, up to you. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, thank you so much, Vidar, for for inviting me to be part of the of this webinar today. You know, Vidar mentioned that we need to achieve 100% um, uh, sustainable ocean management, right? And it's it, it it's crazy that in these days we should be agreeing that we need to manage all of our activities well, right? And when we talk about achieving a balance, indeed, um, I'm going to share my screen with you all now. Um, indeed, we need to achieve a balance because we are totally out of balance with, with the ocean. And right now, uh, extractive um, activities and damaging activities dominate uses of the ocean, and we are definitely out of balance. And this is just one example. What I'd like to, um, you to see here is the downward trajectory of all these graphs. This is the abundance of fish populations. This is the abundance of fish biomass in the water. So the latest studies show that for 1,300 stocks for which we have data, um, over three quarters of them are overexploited. Right? So this definitely um, is uh, putting us out of balance and is threatening the food that we can obtain sustainably from the ocean. Uh, however, today, despite these, these problems, only 7% of the ocean is in what we call marine protected areas, which are areas where we allow the ocean to regenerate. And actually less than 3% of the ocean are in areas that are fully protecting from, from damaging activities. So today I'd like to, as an example of how to balance the extractive and non-extractive uses of the ocean, I'd like to um, use the example of, of marine protected areas. Um, and when I talk to uh, country leaders about, about marine protected areas that are all with four questions. The first one is why do we need protected areas, right? You know, if everybody were like Norway managing their fisheries based in science and managing them well, you know, we would need less protected areas. But you know, why do we need protected areas? Then once they um, understand why, um, then the next question is how much of the ocean we need to protect you know, from this 7% that we have today? and where these areas should be and how much is this going to cost? That's the first question that the Minister of Finance will ask, right? How much is this going to cost? So I'd like to try uh, to answer these, these four questions pretty quickly now. And I think that it's pretty clear already why we need more, more protected areas, but I'd like to show you a visual example because most people haven't seen what happens underwater, right? And we all hear news here and there, and depending on what news we listen to, uh, we get a different picture. So I'd like to show you what happens in an area, typically overfished area, like this one in Cabo Pulmo in Mexico, where in the mid nineties, the local fishermen were so upset not having enough fish to catch that they decided to close an area of only 70 square kilometers to fishing. So the Mexican government created a national park. So when we returned 10 years later to conduct our surveys, this is what we found. This is the same place before, 
and after protection. We saw it come back to pristine in only 10 years, including the return of the large predators like this grouper or sharks or these jacks. And, and the beauty of this is that the community, those former fishermen are now making far more money from diving tourism inside the reserve. And because these fish not only grow larger, but they reproduce more, the communities around the reserve are catching more fish. So it's, it's a win-win. This is one of the win-wins that um, uh, Maria was, was talking about. And this is what we have seen in protected areas around the world. Uh, you know, the fully protected areas where there is no extractive activities are able to increase the abundance of fish by 600% while protected areas that allow commercial activities in them, commercial extractive activities, are not even able to double the biomass, the biomass of fish. And we have seen this all over the world. If we want to restore marine life and help to regenerate the areas around and increase the food and all the other benefits that marine life is giving us, we need to set aside some areas fully protected from all these activities. And this is just one more example showing that uh, you know areas that are partially protected that allow commercial activities are a red herring. They provide an illusion of protection, an illusion of regeneration, but they, they have no social or economic benefits that are different from areas that are unprotected. Um, so this is a very, very important point. So we, the science is very clear that we need to increase the areas that are protected beyond that 3% today that is fully protected. Now, our studies around the world uh, also show that if we are to achieve a series of benefits from protection of biodiversity to avoiding collapse of fisheries to increasing the value of fisheries, we need on average 37% of the ocean in the right, in the right places. So um, to answer the question of, um, well, we already know that we need at least um, no, 30%. Um, some studies point to at least, uh, you know, we need 50%. An average is, is about 50% of the ocean uh, protected to achieve multiple benefits. But we conduct a study that uh, um, Maria mentioned. We conducted a study that looked at the global ocean because we wanted to reconcile protection and uses of the ocean. And we wanted to show what areas, if protected, would not only deliver biodiversity benefits, would protect marine life, but also would give us more food and also help us with climate change. So can we achieve that balance by protecting the right areas so we can achieve multiple benefits? And what we found was that when you look only at biodiversity, there are areas mostly around the coastlines of, of the world that if protected uh, would give us all these benefits from marine life. And marine life is not just a source of food. It also provides oxygen. More than half of the oxygen in the atmosphere is provided by algae and, and microbes in the ocean. It also helps protect our coastlines from the destructive store, uh, power of storms, like in mangrove beds or seagrass beds. It's also the most powerful uh, carbon storehouse on the planet because the seafloor, the sediment on the seafloor stores twice more carbon than all the soils of the land. When we disturb that carbon, we are creating carbon emissions that are very, very significant. So. Uh, when, with this study, we find a way, a, a new framework that uh, points out to the areas that if protected, they would give us multiple benefits. This would be a map for biodiversity. But when we look at the fisheries, you know, the areas that are in yellow here are areas that if fully protected would help to replenish the fisheries around to such a level that the global fish catch would increase by 8 million tons which is about 10% of the, of the global catch today. So there are areas, and, and the more overfished an area is, the more it gets to benefit from uh, protection of, of a fraction of it. So if we want to optimize the benefits of humanity for all, and not just for a few, you know, we need to optimize, we need to identify which areas we need to set aside to help replenish marine life, to help mitigate climate change, and in turn, to help provide more food sustainably for humanity. And this is an example. If we gave the same weight to biodiversity, food and carbon, this would be the areas ranked um, in, in color here. The yellow areas would be the most, the top priority. Um, these are the areas that we would uh, protect to increase the benefits we get from the ocean. So this might seem counterintuitive, 
but the current trajectory, except for a few fisheries and a few activities that are managed well, and, and Norway and the United States have a few of the of these examples. You know, if we were able to increase protection, actually we would be closer to that balance. And, and this is exactly what the world needs because we cannot base uh, the new blue economy in an, an economy that continues overdrafting from from marine from the ocean. But we need to achieve that balance. So instead of 97% of the ocean today, that is like a bank account where everybody withdraws, but nobody makes a deposit. We need some investment accounts in strategic areas, investment accounts that will grow with compound interest, like we have seen in this 600% increase in marine life. But also these accounts will produce returns that we'll be able to enjoy over time in a sustainable way. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, thank you very much. This is really very, very interesting. It is not just a win-win situation, it's win-win-win. So we are going to have biodiversity, 10% more fish and a good climate. Well, great. Let, let me turn now to Beatrice. Beatrice is going to, uh, uh, to focus more on food and fish and we are very looking forward to hear from her. Please, Beatrice. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, it's, yeah, it'll be interesting to follow after Enrique, because um, I'm going to start on land, actually, because um, I can't help, because I was, start, uh, I was asked to, to talk about oceans as a source of food. And uh, we have a situation now where we are pushing up against the limits of the planet, and, and food is a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, pollution, biodiversity loss, to name a few. But of course, at the same time, it's fundamental. It's a fundamental human need. And a few years back, the Eat Lancet report made an attempt at outlining how we can achieve both healthy and sustainable diets for almost 10 billion people. And one conclusion was that it means significantly reducing our consumption of uh, particularly terrestrial animal protein and particularly red meat. And it is in that context that I want to say a few words about the role um, of aquatic foods. And I'll be drawing on some ongoing work by a large group of experts that are working on this topic under the banner of the, the blue food assessment. You'll hear me refer to that. Because, um, you know, what is the role of blue foods or aquatic foods in achieving healthier and sustainable food futures and within the ocean economy? Certainly aquatic foods can be very healthy. Uh, many aquatic foods have the potential to contribute high amounts of, of micronutrients. Uh, and in general, aquatic foods, therefore, have the potential to, you know, on the one hand, reduce micronutrient deficiencies that we know lead to disease, particularly in poor and vulnerable populations. But they can also have a health benefit by replacing consumption of less healthy red and processed meats, for example. However, you know, when, when we discuss the benefits of blue foods, it's so important that we keep reminding ourselves that aquatic foods, they're tremendously diverse and we catch well over a thousand species in taxa and, and farm over, I think it's like 425 species in both freshwaters and marine environments, mind you. But not all of these are, are equally nutritious. And I, I think as part of the um, blue food assessment, Chris Golden and Shakuntala Tilstead, and now I'm gonna share my screen. Um, and a few others have, have been compiling what I believe is the first ever database of almost 3,000 taxa of aquatic foods that show this diversity in nutritional benefits uh, that blue foods contribute to our diets. And, and to show what this difference you know, trans, can translate into, we can take this example that you see now of a single serving of, of small indigenous fish species in, in Bangladesh, for example, which contributes more than five times as much vitamin B12, which is a really important micronutrient for human development, as one single serving of tilapia. And, and in Bangladesh particularly, now this is with aquaculture in mind, but we're seeing this transition away from the small towards tilapia, for example. And then that has implications and we have similar parallels in the marine domain. But so, you know, if, if we keep that this means, to me, this diversity means that nutrient quality of any fishery landings is influenced by the species composition rather than simply by quantity landed. And so if we keep that thought for just a moment and, and reflect on uh, fisheries policy in many countries, 
fisheries policy is still largely focused on international markets, on supplying large quantities of fish and fish products for consumption in not only, but particularly also higher income countries and, and a rising middle class segment of many developing countries. And the unintended consequence of this is often that, you know, nutritionally vulnerable countries end up producing, exporting nutrients while food and nutritional security of their own populations are not necessarily always met. So, for example, the dietary risk of iron deficiency in Namibia, as you can see in this picture, is really high, 47%. And by using only 9% of the fish caught within Namibian waters, for example, you would essentially satisfy the dietary iron requirements for an entire uh, coastal population in that country. So I think to me, the pertinent, but perhaps you know, provocative question is, to pose here is, is whether food is actually uh, the key to survival for, for everyone. And so here I wanna go back and I'll stop sharing for a minute. I wanna go back to where I started, you know, finding sustainable ways of providing healthy diets for all and what the, is the role of, of foods from the oceans in delivering this. And globally, aquatic foods contribute 17% of animal protein consumed. But this figure is, is well over 50% in some countries. And I think those numbers are really interesting and informative in that they tell us that the role that blue foods are likely to play for human well-being is going to vary hugely across countries and cultural contexts. And on the one hand, you know, aquatic foods hold the potential to really address undernourishment in many poor and marginalized communities, particularly coastal communities. But in well-to-do countries, you know, like a country like, like Sweden, where I'm based, we already you know, have a fairly unfairly, you could say, large consumption footprint. And maybe seafood for us is more a means to you know, wean our societies off over consumption of terrestrial meat. It's a stepping stone towards healthier and more sustainable ways of eating. Uh, but it may not be the, a desirable end point. And I say this because I think it's important that we don't land in the you know, uncritical, erroneous conclusion that, that everyone should be aiming to eat more aquatic foods necessarily. And what we do not want is, you know, aquatic foods to just add to an already kind of over full plate for some of us. Uh, because what a lot of seafood, you know, it was mentioned by Vida, I think, you know, they do compare favorably to some terrestrial animal sourced foods, but it's not true for all blue foods. And just like we see you know, nutritional uh, diversity in, in nutritional contribution, we see an equally wide diversity in environmental impact from blue foods where uh, farm bivalves and small pelagics, for example, they generate the smallest environmental footprint across capture fisheries and aquaculture respectively. But while we see quite big impact on biodiversity associated with some wild caught species, and this relates to the previous uh, speaker, but also pollution and emissions associated with you know, aquaculture, for example. So if I just share my screen very briefly again, um, let's see. Here, um, certainly aquaculture has made considerable progress in enhancing the efficiency of how marine resources are used. And uh, this recent review, which was published a couple of weeks ago, shows the remarkable increase in aquaculture output over the last 25 years. And we see that mirroring this development is a tripling of global production of fed fish between 2000 and 2017 while there's been a simultaneous reduction in volumes of forage fish used to make the feed. So that's very positive news. But at the same time, we have work coming out of this blue food assessment that I mentioned that shows that feed production still represents some 70% or over 70% of emissions from fed aquaculture. So the point that I want to make here is that certainly food from the oceans and other aquatic environments is generally nutritious generally compares favorably with terrestrial animal source protein. And it's going to have an important role to play, I think, in shifting to more sustainable and healthy food futures, but they're not a silver bullet. They are highly diverse in both the nutritional benefits that they deliver and the environmental burden that they also incur. And this figure, I think, you know, st starts to show that a little bit, oh, sorry. And it shows that it's just, First of all, caveat is just two dimensions. So it's only nutrition and greenhouse gas emissions. But, and it was done for sort of a more Nordic 
uh, Swedish audience, but it allows us to formulate, you know, if we do this kind of analysis, it allows us to formulate a base from which to discuss, you know, possible win-wins, which someone also mentioned before, the green, where we have high nutrition and, and low imp environmental impact versus this sort of high emissions, low nutrients, which may not be avenues that we want to pursue as a society. Um, and of course, it's important to note also that, you know, I'm only showing greenhouse gases here. Uh, of course, we have multiple other dimensions of environmental impact that have already been mentioned. So, sorry, stop sharing again now and wrap up. But because I think, as Professor Sala noted before me, you know, with a finite set of, of ocean resources, there's always going to be trade-offs. And uh, whenever we rely on ocean resources to produce something. So given this finite amount of food that we can feasibly produce from oceans, I think we need to start asking what types of seafood that should be, you know, who sh and who, who should be eating it. And we need to stop talking about aquatic foods in a, in a broad sweeping terms, because I think it hinders us from having this science-based intelligent conversation about the role that aquatic foods can play. Just like we distinguish between chicken and pork, we should be distinguishing between cod, salmon, herring, mussels, because science shows us that they are very different across so many environmental and nutritional dimensions. And uh, there are a number of scientific studies emerging just now or in the pipeline, some within this blood food assessment, which cross compare CFAs for a number of nutrients and environmental stresses, and which can and I think should provide valuable input to policy and industry regarding you know, where efficiency gains can be had, but also where significant reductions in impact can be made. And I think by making, you know, making these changes happen, so prioritizing you know, high nutrients, low stress of blue foods, for example, that's going to require both shifting current demand and creating the appropriate incentives and reducing barriers for, for producers to deliver on this. And I think shifting demand is largely about shifting consumer incentives. So how you know, how do we shift ingrained cultural habits of eating that currently prevent some of these changes? That, that's not something that I can speak to. But the other thing is, is shifting incentives of producers. And that's, of course, partly about regulation, but it's also about conditioning, I think, investments to help steer towards production of that, which is healthy and sustainable. And I think the investment community has a much bigger role, should have a much bigger role to play to achieve this in the future. So I'll be Really keen to hear what, uh, what Professor Samila has to say about that next. Thank you. So this is uh, really interesting and a little provocative. Uh, and I'm looking forward to discuss with you about this high diversity in uh, blue food, especially coming from aquaculture or fisheries. Okay, but this can uh, bring us easily and smoothly to Rashid. Rashid is going to give us uh, his perspective on the economies of the whole. Uh, Rashid, up to you. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, I will try to get. I will try to get my uh, my slide up and running. Oh, okay. So yeah, so thank you very much for inviting me. This is uh, it's a privilege to get to be part of this and to share ideas and and so on. So the topic I'll be looking at is ocean finance and equity. And uh, because there's equity in ocean finance, you know, and so we, and vice versa. So we need to look at both of them. But before I do that, I just want to reemphasize what you have heard and what you know, our ocean is under threat from multiple sources. And I don't need to go through this. You've heard them, you know them. And, but that is a point to have in mind, you know, we are not managing our ocean and ocean life and uh, ocean resources uh, wisely uh, as we should, I think. So that's point number one. The second point I want to make is that declining ocean is not just about the biodiversity and I'm an economist, right? So I care about biodiversity. I know they're important. They have, the biodiversity has a right to be part of the world because it is part of the world. We have no right to destroy it just on its own. But as an economist, my big reason for fighting so hard to sustain our ocean is because a declining ocean has serious consequences on 
on, on human beings, on people. So here you have on this side of my slide, you have uh, data, which is a summary of what uh, Enric showed you of species upon species declining. Here we summarize it over, over since 1950 to now. And what you see, the top two are from our group PSC around us and UBC. And the bottom one here is from the FAO. And both of these are showing that we are really overdoing this. More and more of our fish are coming from depleted and sometimes crash uh, fish stock. So, and this is not just like I said about the fish, it's about people. So this guy up here going out and working, is this all the shrimp I get? So this is what you get when you mess up biodiversity. And how about this lady here? This is what we are beginning to see more and more environmental refugees, people who are forced to leave their communities because life is not just bearable. And I tell you, human beings move when life is difficult. This has nothing to do with West Africans or any group. It's every person, if life is too hard in a place, you move. That's why we have brains. So the point from this slide is, if we want a stable world, we want a world where there is no forced migration, we have to take care of our biodiversity, our ocean, because they are interlinked. We mess up biodiversity, you are gonna have this. And walls cannot stop people, okay? They can't stop fish, so they can't stop people too. So that's my second point. Now let's get to the financial, the finance part. Yeah, this is, um, I'm summarizing very briefly because of time. If you want to read more, the report is on the web of the High Level Panel for Sustainable Ocean Economy. I was asked to put together a team and we have 23 people coming together from all continents of the world, men and women working uh, together to produce this. So we have all sorts of angles taken into the report and I urge you to read it. In fact, only Friday, I got news from Nature Communications. The tight version of this is now accepted and you soon see it in the primary literature. Now, some highlights from the report. The ocean economy is a cornerstone of the global economy, contributing trillions each year. The OECD estimates about three trillion, three trillion in the next few years. That will be the contribution. That is a lot. Despite this, the sector is drastically underinvested. We could only find about 1% of the ocean economy's total value. In fact, less than 1% of, of the ocean total ocean invested in sustainable projects to date of the ocean. Can you imagine that? Less than 1% of what is produced. This is gross underinvestment, right? Meanwhile, we have all these stresses, climate change, pollution, overfishing, what have you, ocean acidification, deoxygenation, you, could, you can list a ton of things happening. So we need to do something, but to do this effectively and achieve sustainable ocean economies, significantly greater finance needs to be made available. We all know that you can have the best idea in the world. It dies at the altar of no finance. So the finance has to be increased and the quality of the finance has to be important, right? We want finance that helps sustain the economic activities, not destroy it, right? In the short term. So, so that is crucial. Now, the good news is that actually looking at the data, investing in the ocean is good business, you know, it's good business. And some reports are showing that if you spend a dollar, you get at least $5 back. So this is good investment in how you look at it, right? So the question is, why are we not doing it? And I think there's a lot here. I, Elka may touch on this, the human side of things, all the, the game theory, people racing for the fish and so on. But, but if you think of this, <clears throat> is good business. Investing in effectively managed MPS can increase habitat protection, the, as we have seen from that amazing photo that uh, Enrique showed us. So, so it looks good. It's just for us to get the political will, as Maria said, to do something. So again, less than 1% goes in there. Looking at the Mediterranean countries alone, a steady found out that uh, there's a shortfall in the money needed the resources needed to support the network of modern protected areas so they can do the work we want them to do, to give us diversity, to give us resilience. 
almost $800 million shortfall. So globally, it's much larger. That is a point to, to keep. In our report, we spent a lot of time trying to explain why the barriers, why is ocean finance not more than what it is? Why is the quality not more than what it is? And, and, and this is just a few of the things we found. There are still gaps in understanding of the ways the ocean economy contributes to the wider global economy and to our wider social and cultural uh, activities, right? If you ask indigenous people in British Columbia, they'll tell you that the value of a sockeye salmon, it's not just the, the dollars you get by selling a pound or a, a kilogram of it. It's about their health. It's about their culture. It's about their way of life. So there is a lot of value, but up to now, we don't fully understand that and we need to have that knowledge. Activities like oil and gas and unsustainable fishing, which create negative impacts on the ocean and the environment are heavily subsidized. This is what I mean by the quality. The I think is the IMF estimates about $4.7 trillion of subsidies given to the oil and gas sector. Think of all what that sector does to climate change and CO2 emission. This is the craziest economics you can do. These people have to be taxed, not to be given subsidies because they are creating what we call negative externalities. What they do impacts the world, impacts the environment and impacts people. We should tax them, but we give them all this money. And, and how about the fishery sector? Our group, we estimate $35 billion a year going into the sector as government subsidies. And over 60% of this is actually what we describe as harmful subsidies, like fewer subsidies. that encourage overfishing. Why will you do that? The WTO is working hard to deal with this for 20 years. They have not been able to because there's no political will. Short-termism is stopping the world. The world's population has to push our governments and leaders to do what really will work for all of us. And, and that is our comeback to subsidies again uh, at the end of this. So in the report and in our paper, which has just been accepted, we spend a lot of time talking about how can we push away these barriers and allow good quality, good amount of uh, investment to be made in the ocean, which actually helps to sustain us. So one of them is to set up and implement new common guidelines and principles that will help define what sustainable investment in the ocean economy will look like. So we don't want subsidies that lead to pumping out of CO2, right? Or taking the fish down. So our grandchildren don't have fish to eat. We don't want that. So guidelines will be important. Strengthen knowledge, data, capacity, in our developing part of the world, we need to really uh, do what we can both internally, domestically by these countries, but internationally. Because you know what? We cannot have a healthy ocean when parts of the ocean are not healthy. As well as we cannot have a healthy world, a healthy uh, people when parts of the world's population is in dear need. So we need to do these things together. Without good biodiversity, without good distribution of the benefits, we are toast in the long run. Create supportive and inclusive enabling environment. That is the point. That's why we have government. So stimulate pipelines of investable, sustainable projects. And there are lots of good ideas coming up here, like uh, new green bonds and, and, and arrangements where the, the creditors give countries uh, uh, relief on their in interest so that they can use the money to manage their resources. The seashells is a good one, working with TA, TNC and, and with the Paris Club, uh, releasing funds to help do spatial management. Those kind of creative things we need to, to do. Insurance can play a good part. Uh, there's no time, I can give you more details, but they are in the report and in the paper. Uh, so this is my final slide. And here I'm trying to bring ocean finance, equity and sustainable, uh, the sustainability of the ocean together. And I think to be able to do this, the policies and actions we, we, we take should be designed to eliminate what I see as negative feedback from people to nature, to the ocean and the ocean to people. Rather, we want to do things, policies, put policies and actions that will lead to positive feedback from people to the ocean and ocean to the people. Quick example, subsidies. Our, our study showed that 80% of all the 35 billion governments give to the fishing sector go to large scale industrial fishing fleets. 
only 20% of the small community base place. This ties to Beatrice's point. I mean, where is the equity here? So we are using our taxpayer money to aggravate inequalities in society, to disadvantage women because more women fish in small scale than in large scale, to advantage the youth because a young person doesn't start with a big industrial boat. Why will you do this? You're making the world actually worse. And, and if you do that, the community then, they need their food. They hang on the last fish and the fish cannot help them. Destroy it together, you go into what we call the prisoner's dilemma. You don't do that. High seas protection, for example, without subsidies, 54% of the fishing grounds in, in, in the high seas will not be sustainable. So again, our tax, taxes are making a few countries go out into the high seas, grab the fish that Guinea-Bissau may be able to benefit. If we close the whole high seas from fishing, make it a fish bank, the fish will come into small countries and big countries alike, and we catch them with less CO2 pump, a beautiful win-win-win. This is, has been said again and again. So there are lots of things we need to do at the policy level and at the action level, from the local to the national to the global, in order to make our oceans Sustainable. In fact, I call this kind of behavior, uh, attitude, making all this work together. That will lead us to what I call Infinity Fish, which is the title of a book I'm just finishing. I'll publish it. Infinity, Infinity Fish is a beautiful concept. We can manage our fisheries so it can give us benefits through time. And anything that gives you benefit through time, even no matter how small, will give you infinity benefits. And that is what life in the ocean can give us. Let's make it work for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rashid. Really inspiring to hear about this infinity fish. We are looking forward. Now I'm turning to Elke, last but not least. And Elke is going to bring uh, here on the table some very important issues like social needs and social emotions. So Elke, up to you. Thank you, Maria, and it's a real pleasure and privilege to be part of this panel. Let me start sharing my screen. And um, tell you a little bit about uh, decision-making in, uh, in complex realities, including the ocean context. Mm -hmm. So uh, here we go. Uh, what, what's complex about these realities? Well, you've heard from the previous speakers that as we manage uh, ocean economies at these different levels uh, and ocean ecology at the same time for sustainability, there are deep uncertainties about both the problems you know, and, and, and the solutions. Uh, there's a threat of tipping points as we exceed you know, our planetary boundaries. Um, and the actors and stakeholders that we're dealing with uh, are multiple and, and diverse. Uh, both in who they are, we're talking about uh, civil society on the one hand, you know, the private sector, uh, the public sector. Uh, these, these actors have different goals, uh, different time horizons, different sources of power. Uh, yeah, those, those differences in goals necessitate intra and interpersonal trade-offs. Uh, that are hard for people, we, we like to have it all. <laughs> and also Rashid talked uh, very eloquently about the intra and intergenerational equity considerations that we face in this context. So there are many problems to be solved. Uh, you also know that we've called our time period the Anthropocene, you know, to describe the fact that it's human behavior, human behavior related to energy, human behavior related to resource extraction here you know, more generally are really shaping the environment. And unfortunately, not oftentimes in, 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 in good ways. And then the basic question I want to address in my short presentation is, you know, what guides the behavior that we're talking about? What are our assumptions about who is making these decisions you know, at the individual level uh, and also at, 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 at higher policy levels? Who are the decision makers? And the ruling assumption really is still one of rational uh, expectations and rational choice, you know, homo economicus. Uh, and uh, that perceptions, uh, comprehensions uh, that are different from rationality are oftentimes only considered ex post. Yeah, when things are not working right, we bring in the psychologists to help us implement these policies, you know, to market these policies in better ways, say it louder. Uh, it's quite mind boggling to me that the first assessment report from the IPCC uh, that actually talked about anything other than non-rational decision processes was the previous one in 2014. So it took five rounds to even sort of bring this to the attention of that body, policy body. So what I want to talk about are two things. How do people, all people, all of us, uh, 
the public uh, consumers uh, and that also policymakers, how do they differ from Homo economicus? What species are we actually talking about, Homo sapiens? And also how do people differ from each other and how can we sort of capitalize on what we know about you know, sort of how diverse our uh, information processing and our perceptions are? So what should you know about Homo sapiens? In a slide, uh, there's a lot to talk about. Uh, but the first point to make is that we are subject to finite attention and processing capacity. We are boundedly rational. Yes, we are rational, but we are bounded rational. Uh, and uh, yeah, that this bounded rationality leads us to the myopia uh, and the status quo bias that Rashid and other people talked about before. Uh, uh, query theory is a theory that I put forward with Eric Johnson a few years ago that talks about how we make decisions that the, the fact that finite attentional capacity makes us consider choice options sequentially. So uh, in this uh, slide, in, in this reversible image that you see, uh, you can either see the uh, candlestick, if white is what you focus on, you can see the two children looking at each other, if black is the foreground. Uh, you can certainly switch back and forth between those two, two precepts, uh, percepts, but you really can't see them both at the same time. And the assumption is that when we make decisions, the same is true. We focus on one option, uh, getting immediate consumption now, uh, or the other option, you know, fishing more, fishing less, and therefore having more fish down the road, you know, sort of to, to be fished uh, second. But we can't do both at the same time. Turns out all other things being equal, the first option you focus on has a sizable advantage. Uh, and I won't have time to tell you why, but it's well documented. So then the million dollar question in a way is which options get considered first? Turns out that status quo is something we tend to consider first, which makes perfect sense, right? We've been doing it for a good reason, probably uh, for a while to start with. Uh, it hasn't killed us yet, so it can't be all that dangerous. So it makes perfect sense to maybe think about the status quo one first, but it also then gets us to uh, the status quo bias that we exhibit. Uh, also turns out that attractively packaged or labeled options have an advantage. And so just to give you a quick example, a few years ago, I was wondering about the fact that um, most Americans actually hate carbon taxes, but they're also willing to pay this carbon user fee that was caused, called an offset when they travel around the country. Uh, and the question was, are those different people who buy the offset but hate the taxes? Or is there something about the label that makes us sort of like one option better, one user fee better than the other? So people were given a large national representative sample. People were given a choice between a ticket that included a carbon user fee uh, at $7.70 or just the airline ticket without the fee. Uh, they were given in, uh, two pages of instructions about how, why that was calculated, uh, what the, the fee was going to do, identical for everyone. The only difference between subjects was, was this user fee called a carbon tax or a carbon offset? Uh, and so as you see in the slide here, uh, when the offset label was used, it didn't uh, basically something like 62% of uh, Americans actually liked uh, the inclusive ticket that shows the inclusive tickets. And when we afterwards asked them uh, what their political affiliation was, it didn't matter. Democrats as Republicans really like this user fee, uh, when it's called a carbon offset. When the label is switched to a carbon tax, it doesn't matter for the Democrats, but for the Republicans, you know, the, the uptake goes down to 27%. Um, and uh, the, the whole difference in choice between those two labels is completely accounted for by how uh, these people's attention switch. When the Republicans see the word carbon tax, they immediately switch away from that option. You can tell this by eye movements, by other process tracing methods. They look at the other fee, uh, the, other, the other option that doesn't include the fee. Uh, that results in a larger number of arguments, you know, sort of for not having the carbon tax, and it completely mediates the differences in choice. So let's go back to our list about what else we should know about uh, Homo sapiens. Uh, we have many goals uh, and oftentimes conflicting goals. Yes, of course we have uh, self-regarding uh, goals, but also we have fo focusing on others. Yeah, we do have preferences for future generations. Uh, we have psychological goals. We want to feel uh, confident in our decisions. Uh, to the extent that these goals are contradictory, we want to have our cake now and eat it too. Uh, it's really important to realize that a goal only plays a role when it's active in a situation. And of course, that is a recipe also for, for intervention. How to prime sustainability goals, for example, by the physical, social, or cultural context in which these decisions are being, getting made. Uh, an important point that actually won the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 2002 is, is the insight that evaluate, outcomes are evaluated in a relative fashion. Uh, how good uh, is $10,000? Well, compared to what? Uh, compared to nothing, it's great. Compared to a million dollars, it's, not, it's not, not very much. And so we can actually sort of reshape people's experience of outcomes by shifting their reference points. 
Uh, also, Homo sapiens learns best by trial and error, by getting hurt. <laughs> seeing is believing. Seeing the negative consequences of something convinces people that the action was bad. Uh, positive consequences encourages behavior. Uh, but at the same time, also, we are tribal creatures. You know, we're committed to our convictions and to our group convictions. So oftentimes, believing also is seeing. So we might actually under attend uh, to causes that are contrary to our political ideology. And then the last point to make is that we make decisions in multiple ways. Yes, we oftentimes are analytic, we make calculation-based decisions, but all the ways of processing that are automatic to all of us are making decisions based on emotions, on both positive and negative emotions. If it's good, we approach. If it's scary, we back off. Or on our social identities, on our roles that oftentimes come with rules of conduct, whether those are uh, standard operating procedures in a company context, you know, or moral rules of conduct that are part of our identity. Uh, and it turns out that NGOs you know, who have been very successful in the conservation space, like RARE, for example, have been using these emotional and social processes for a long time you know, to shape their interventions uh, in, 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 in these environments. So why should we incorporate more realistic models of human, the human actor going from homo economicus to homo sapiens? Well, on the one hand, is, it is a complication. It increases our uncertainty, our ability to predict uh, the uh, effect of, of certain kinds of policy interventions. For example, uh, this, the second paper on the bottom here by Beckage a couple of years ago was uh, basically demonstrating that uh, incorporating social uncertainty about, and, and, and diversity in, in, in people's responses was uh, increasing our ability to predict 2100 global temperatures by the same amount as our uncertainties about the physical and the climate system. So it does increase yeah, our uncertainty. On the other hand, uh, and probably outweighing the disadvantage, uh, it, it provides an opportunity. It provides us an opportunity to explain the biases, the status quo bias, you know, the present bias that, that Rashid mentioned. Uh, and it increases our entry points for behavior change, how to change behavior that is you know, disadvantaged, advantageous for the individual and for society in the long run, uh, and uh, provides uptake for supply side solutions and add demand side solutions. Uh, and you know, the current version of the IPCC report, for example, has for the first time a standalone chapter on demand side solutions that are being encouraged uh, and enabled by understanding more about human behavior uh, in this context. Uh, I want to give you uh, a couple of pointers to tools uh, if you are interested in, in thinking about behavior change. Uh, in the ocean context uh, that is a result of greater insights into the psychological uh, makeup of, of human decision makers. Uh, a few years ago, I was asked to put together a uh, summary of tools for the Behavioral Science and Policy uh, Association in the United States related to energy and environment related behaviors. Uh, but you know, the, the, the set of 13 tools that are the result of trying to deal with four objectives, getting people's attention, because we might not be focusing on what, what the behavior change entails, uh, engaging their desire to contribute to the social goal that we all have to different degrees, perhaps, but we all have that, but it needs to be activated, uh, and to provide people with the kind of information uh, that they need to correctly uh, make these kinds of assessments that are oftentimes are not made correctly because they're not made analytically, but by, by, by more emotion or by uh, more uh, social uh, uh, role-based processes. You know, how to do that? They apply equally, I think, to resource extraction behaviors as they apply to uh, uh, energy-related behaviors. Uh, another uh, tool to make you aware of that's about to come out in sustainability science and actually involves a couple of researchers from the Stockholm Resilience Center. Uh, we put together a, a framework that incorporates uh, what we have learned over the last 30, 40 years about human decision making, the kinds of processes, starting with perception, perhaps biased perception, biased attention, uh, evaluations and choice uh, back to a behavior that feeds back to the social and physical environment. Uh, and incorporating uh, the individual into the social and biophysical context, which is not oftentimes done in psychology, but it's really done more by you know, sort of researchers in, in the field. Uh, but they're providing an inventory of the, the, the underlying theories uh, that help us explain for these kinds of phenomena that are not being accounted for by rational expectations, by rational choice. Uh, and uh, allowing them access to these theories, you know, or perhaps comparison be between these theories to make uh, the, the, the kinds of models uh, and resulting from these models, the kinds of policies and interventions uh, more efficacious uh, and more on target. So let me summarize. 
Uh, what do we get by expanding uh, our understanding of the full diversity of human goals, human needs, human objectives, uh, and uh, processing of information, the decision modes, not just homo economicus, but uh, homo economicus and homo sapiens combined? Uh, well, it's an asset that can explain many existing puzzles. Yeah. The behavior is only an anomaly uh, uh, if you assume that people are acting rationally, uh, but you know, they have their own rationality and their own reasons. Uh, it allows for the design of decision environments that avoids the pitfalls of bonded rationality uh, and capitalize on, on the strengths that humans bring to the table in some sort of psychological jujitsu where we turn the processes that may result in, in disadvantageous results around in such a way that they result in, in choices uh, and in behavior that will uh, lead us to sustainability in the long run. Um, and the tools uh, actually that come as, as part and parcel of that better understanding uh, are helpful in situations where the economic or legal tools uh, that we have uh, may be hard to implement in, for various reasons, but it also provides us with ways of implementing those tools in more effective ways. Uh, and that includes overcoming status quo bias, overcoming present bias, priming longer time horizons, which is really important. Uh, the use of positive emotions and negative emotions uh, used strategically. Uh, the use of tribal identities to create appropriate social norms, uh, using social needs and social emotions for norm enforcement, and lastly, uh, to embrace differences in values that are really a necessary requirement for these win-win solutions that almost all of the previous speakers have talked about. So for, with that, I will thank you for your scarce attention, uh, and I think we uh, go back to Maria. Thank you very much. This is really interesting. Um, I, I, we can start our conversation now. My plan is to put to raise up some questions for you all, but of course, all the members of the panel can intervene and uh, uh, say their own opinion. And I'm starting from Rashid. I know he is in urgency. So I would like to focus on your last slide with the two uh, examples. You mentioned subsidies and high seas treaties, and uh, you tried to uh, explain to us how we can turn a vicious cycle to a virtuous one through the good spend of our public and private money. So um, uh, you know better than me, of course, that we have a new chair in WTO, a great lady from Nigeria, Miss Dr. Okonzo Egoela. So what is next, Rashid? Can you see some optimism, optimism referring to fishery subsidies and other subsidies as you explained to us? Yeah, so thank you for the question. And uh, the subsidy struggle has been long, as you know. We started, I know. The WTO, the WTO started in 2001 and, and I've been in this, our group who put up the databases, analysis, traveled all over the world except Antarctica to talk to government people, NGOs, just to try to make this thing clear that using our public funds to really undermine the resources is not good for anybody, except if you are really too short term. So, so now uh, I was almost, I mean, it's been such a struggle. I, I, I virtually lost hope and then appears our dear Ngozi from Nigeria. And, and she gives me a lot of hope. That is the one thing that has increase my optimism that we may be able to get this thing done this year. So if the if the dear sister is listening, this is for you. You, you came out, you're one of the first directors I know that have come out clearly to say, we have to do something about this. It's not good for our ocean, it's not good for our people. So my plea is for everyone here listening, if there's any way you can support your governments and delegates to get this done. And we are not saying take the money away from the communities. I love the fishing community. I want more money to go into there, but do use public funds to take down the, the resources people depend on for food, for livelihood in these communities. If you go to West Africa, they have lost millions of people who depend on fish. If you take this away, if we lose this thing, you know what that will mean? I mean, socially, economically, not only in this region, but all over the world. So this is why this is so close to my heart. So. We need to take this down. I have some optimism and hopefully we'll get it done with the support of our new DG and, and all the people with goodwill for nature and people. Yeah, this is great. And what uh, makes sense is that if we take this public money, then we can, um, uh, we can fund other priorities that are very, very important. So anybody has to add something on this subsidies issue? 
So, if not so, let me turn to Vidar. And um, I would like, I mean, I remember whatever you said about the global scape and the governments and what is happening right now. So uh, my question comes to the point that we can see some countries as the countries participating in the high level panel or other countries with high ambition and protection as you explained. And uh, the, the work done by high level panel was really great, but we have a lot of small island countries around the world, we have poor countries who cannot afford fund conservation issues and uh, things like that. So I'm wondering if you have any ideas, if you can enlighten us, how we can bring these states closely to the other countries, to the more advanced countries, to G7, to G20, to the conservation world. Any thoughts on that? And also, this is something I would like the other panelists to think of. Please, Vida. Well, I, I think clearly some of the countries you're referring to are countries that have uh, a very close uh, understanding of uh, what's at stake, because if you're a small island state, you're also a big ocean state, and uh, you have lived from the ocean for generations, and you're witnessing ecosystems changing, and you're witnessing damage to the ocean affecting your communities already. Um, so the challenge is there's so much at stake at the same time these countries Many of them have limited capacities. So I think there are a few things that need to be done. Um, firstly, some countries uh, could come together. And one of the member states of the high level panel, Fiji, initiated a group of countries in the Pacific that came out, I think as the first group of countries to say, we opt for 100% ocean management, including 30% protection. Uh, now these countries obviously need international support. So the next step is to build an international support structure. But I think small island states are better equipped and better placed to get such support if they team up uh, together. And then we see both at the global level, actors like the World Bank, the UNDP, the GEF, and not least at the regional level, uh, the regional development banks, or some of the regional development banks at least, uh, have an increasing attention on the ocean and are establishing programs that can be supportive of such uh, uh, countries. So I think there are opportunities, but there clearly also needs in the development community to be more attention on the ocean. If you compare today, attention on agriculture in development, international development assistance, and attention to the ocean, it's very clear that we need more attention to the blue. Yeah, this is great. And actually I have heard that uh, the USA administration is going to convene on the day of Earth, 22nd of April, uh, some uh, days ahead of us, a big climate summit. So I hope that ocean will be present there at last because ocean is not always present, as you said. But uh, you, you know what I mean? Sometimes uh, we receive complaints for the, from the leaders of these countries that, okay, these are great ideas, but now we have pandemic, we have this, we have that. So where the money is coming from? World Bank is doing a lot and GEF, but perhaps we need uh, other mechanisms. I don't know. Uh, Eric, since we have this great study and also it's a great tool because it can show us where we can position marine protected areas. Do you have any ideas? What is next? What are your plans? Where we can find the money? How we can be cost effective? I have read an article by you and I was impressed that uh, you said that uh, we can uh, have all the money we need for 30 by 30, protect 30% 30 of the ocean by 2030. This money will be less than what we spend uh, in video games. Is it true? Well, today we spend more money on ice cream than we spend on protection <laughs> of the ocean. And uh, yeah, that was an economic study that we did last year showing that it, you know the science is very clear. If we want to prevent the extinction of 1 million species and all the benefits they provide to society, if we want to prevent the collapse of our life support system, if we want to achieve the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement, we need half of the planet in its natural state. And a great way to start is to get at least 30% of land and ocean protected by 2030. But yeah, the first question, well, how much this is going to cost? Rashid already showed that for every dollar that we invest 
in nature, actually for every dollar invested in protected areas, that generates $10 in economic output. And also the economic output, the global GDP would be greater with 30% protected than continuing with the law of diminishing returns of you know, over exploitation of, of a renewable, renewable uh, resources. And um, so what we found was that uh, the, what would be required to manage and operate a network of protected areas covering 30% of the planet was less than what people spend on video games today. But the ocean, protecting 30% of the ocean would have a cost of $15 billion per year. This is less than the government subsidies that are used to activities that continue depleting marine life. So the money is there. We just use it to fund, to prop up the destruction of nature instead of investing in, in, in true sustainability. So what we're planning to do with, you know, our study that was published three weeks ago in Nature shows that if we protect the right places in the ocean, we could avoid this zero-sum game of, of the ocean because usually it's my industry. I want to exp maximize the short-term benefit for my industry or else, right? That's the, the view that predominates. But we show that if, as uh, Vidar has been claiming, if we manage all of the ocean sustainably and at least 30% of the ocean strategically is protected and set aside, everybody gets to win. And for this, we need a huge education work because you know we are asked to provide the science, but when we provide the science that goes against the myths that some industries um, perpetuate, then, oh, that science is not convenient, right? So, um, and I'll let Elke uh, figure out how to help us yeah. with this, but there is a lot of um, education and, and discussions uh, we need to have because you know we, we are not saying that we should stop this or, or or only do that. We're saying that we can reconcile all uses of the ocean in a way to reach that vision that Vidar is talking about. Yeah, this is great, and uh, this yes brings me to hell to Elke. So uh, having uh, we have attended your presentation, great presentation. So can really your models help us persuade the people that this is the best way to go? And uh, how can I say to um, you? You raised up this issue of the conflict between short-termism and long-term solutions, the real interest, the psychological factors. Can you can you help us really to take the good decisions needed? Well, you, you're raising a really important question. I think you put your finger on sort of the time horizon and the fact that sort of you know. We, from an evolutionary perspective, we're focusing as individuals and oftentimes also as policymakers on the here and now. Uh, because yeah, sort of in, 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 in olden days, uh, it, it didn't matter if you, know, if you didn't survive till tomorrow, you, know, sort of, you, know, you didn't have to sort of budget for the future. Uh, and you know, for elected, elected officials, you know, sort of what's something that sort of has consequences in the next year and the next couple of years is more important than, than has consequences in 20 or 30 years time. So how do we convince people uh, that now the issues have become so complex that we need to spend more of our precious attention on the future? And yeah, as I was saying, yeah, the query series suggests that one way of doing that, yeah, how to sort of give the future more of a chance is to put the, 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 the future facing alternatives first in front of them. Uh, this also gets us a little bit to status quo bias, you know, that sort of we, 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 we tend to focus on what we've been doing conventionally first, and then we think about what, what's good about uh, sort of, you know, novelty, about, about uh, different ways of doing it. Well, why don't we sort of switch things around and, 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 and design our information in such a way that sort of, you know, the, 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 the future is in your face first. Now, that, that can be done individually you know, by sort of having websites you know, that, 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 that feature certain options first. Uh, you know, it, it can be done by information campaigns that focus on, on, on those options first. But also, I think we have to think about that it's, it's, it's an institutional level. Uh, and yeah, sometimes novelists can help us. Uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, uh, who is a, a science fiction writer, actually has been specializing on uh, a, a new body of work called CLIFI, you know, climate change science fiction in the last 20, 30 years or so. His most recent book is called The Ministry of the Future. And he basically makes the argument, you know, in, in, in this book, it's basically done sort of at the UN level, but we really need to have institutions that are not focused on a topic, like on oceans, you know, on, on climate. We also need to have institutions maybe whose primary function is there to put our noses 
put, put the future in front of us, you know, sort of as, as, as a priority. It reminds us of the fact, because we don't do it naturally, it reminds us of the fact how important the future and how important sustainability is uh, economically, uh, socially, uh, for health reasons, uh, for the sake of the planet, uh, because we tend to sort of forget about that because other concerns are more uh, immediate yeah, and therefore take precedence. So I think we should think about not just how to do it at the individual level, but also at the institutional level. And it turns out yeah, that I just recently heard him on, on, on another uh, video call, and he talked about the fact that some uh, jurisdictions like Wales or Korea actually have started to do that, yeah, sort of have ministries for the future that, 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 that do that. So I think it's a, it's a really interesting way of putting something that is very theoretical at the individual level uh, in, in action, uh, but not just at the individual level, but also at, at at, 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 at levels higher up, where, where it might be more effective. Well, this is a great idea. Okay, I don't know. So perhaps Vidar can, can say us more because Vidar, you have a great uh, governmental experience and also you have all this experience, um, um, how can I say, leading this initiative about the high level panel. So what about the future really? Do you think that they, they have created, these countries, they have created a great model, a great partnership, a new example. Can it have, um, and also they came with uh, a lot of uh, recommendations. So what about the future? Can they be the start of a new initiative for the future? What is next of the high level panel? Uh, well, what is next is definitely for the countries to live up to their commitments. Of course. And for that to happen, I think uh, scientists, NGOs, media all need to, uh, hold them accountable, but the, recommend, the science-based recommendations of the panel were not only recommendations, they were actually commitments that these countries want to undertake. And um, um, I know they're now discussing moving forward on that, and at the same time, uh, other countries are signaling an interest in, in joining forces. And I think the process itself was interesting. It was not a UN initiative, it was a, a an initiative driven by these countries um, and with a very close, close proximity to knowledge production. And, and I experienced in our discussions, obviously, that when you have this, when you have the scientists in the room while you're uh, discussing policy, it's hard to escape the facts. Um, and that's uh, probably one aspect of achieving behavioral change is to uh, uh, bring those with a provision of knowledge to the decision-making table. And I think that's all the more important because we need solutions at scale, we need solutions at speed and of incredible complexity. And politicians can't do that alone. They need knowledge on an ongoing basis. Also to be able to adapt if the choice they make turn out not to be as good as they thought. So um, I think the panel uh, has set an example that could be replicated in other settings. Yeah, this is interesting. So I'm, I'm, I'm turning now to Beatrice to discuss a little bit about her presentation, the blue food and the, the provocative questions. So having in mind this high diversity between the different types of uh, seafood coming from fisheries or aquaculture, uh, do you think that we have to prevent, to provide incentives for the industry to come for these types of food production that can be more useful to people. For example, I noticed in your presentation that some um, uh, types of aquaculture like bivalves and seaweed, I'm coming to seaweed because seaweed and bivalves are types of restorative aquaculture. They cannot do a lot of harm and they can give us food. So do you believe that we have to differentiate our motivations, our incentives towards the industry, referring to this, the findings of your study? Well, I think, um, I think as the point that I was trying to make is that um, often when we talk about uh, foods from the oceans, we talk about it just like I did now, foods from the oceans, as if it's one type of food. And when we refer to them as that, well, we need to eat more aquatic foods like in dietary guidelines as a means to reduce our environmental footprints. We again refer to it as, as you know fish in general but those of us and you too who would work with this know that of course there is this huge diversity and that's what I wanted to flag up that within that big portfolio of 
what we call, you know, fish or seafood are, are types of foods that are highly nutritious and really beneficial at, at fairly low environmental impacts. All food production has some environmental impact. While, of course, then we have those that are perhaps, they'll all have nutrients, but they'll be less from a point of view, like less diverse in their micronutrients that they can contribute to our diets while also incurring a really high environmental footprint. And so I don't think uh, it, it's my place or the place of the blue food assessment to say we should not produce you know, seafood X, we should only produce this. But I think we need to be much more aware of that diversity as we move forward now in, in the context of trying to, you know, looking at the oceans to develop, to, to provide increasing amounts of food. I, I think we have to engage more with that diversity and looking where is it also, you know, environmentally, you know, perhaps good to be producing a particular seafood, but is that it's not necessarily something that needs to be scaled up, you know, to everywhere. And looking at the, the relationship between that environment, those uh, diversity uh, of environmental impact, because it's not just greenhouse gas emissions, as we know, you know, it is biodiversity loss if you're looking at a lot of capture fisheries. But for aquaculture, it, it's other things. And so looking at how does that weigh up against the nutritional benefits? And I think you said provocative. I, I don't mean to be provocative, really, but I do think there's an equity angle here in that uh, I think we're all aware that, you know, the oceans are great there. We talk about them as a last frontier. But, you know, as I think Evita mentioned at the start, you know, there's so much pressure, so much expectations of the oceans to deliver now that, of course, food production from the oceans is also competing for that same space. And we just can't expect it to also produce all of that food while simultaneously setting aside areas for conservation and having you know, oceans to fulfill all the other things we wanted to fulfill in terms of biodiversity and healthy ecosystems. There's, there will be a limit. And then we need to consider well, how can we maximize the benefit for the greater amount of people and the people who really need you know, to up their nutritional status. Maybe it's not people like me, you know, maybe there are other people. And that's, I don't know if that's a provocative question, but I think it's an important question to be having. Okay, to, to think in a more positive way, what can be the incentives we can give to the industry to follow up on this? What, what are the obstacles they have to overcome? What we, how we can help them? So I think, um, uh, Rashid, who now left, unfortunately, but, you know, I, was, I, I also helped with some of that work. And I think from the financial sector, you know, it's setting the incentives for, for producers as well. I think that where we start to um, include in, for example, funding, uh, financial services, including uh, requirements of, of blue food producers to, uh, you know, be sustainable, but also perhaps look, starting to introduce nutritional aspects uh, into those guidelines uh, of, you know, what should we be investing in? I don't have the definite answer down to the detail levels, but so we can have sustainability aspects like, you know, the fisheries principles. So, so what is the principles for invest investment in sustainable wild catch fisheries, for example? That's, that's one of those types of guidelines that have been developed. If we start to merge those into investment criteria, and I'm talking about investment criteria for, you know, financial services, for banks, these sorts of things, that starts to slowly also you know, direct in a, in a particular way how investments are funded and how producers are producing. It's not, it's not necessarily sufficient, but it's a one way along the line. And if you can also then introduce nutritional aspects into this, I think, you know, then we're on the way to sort of having, a, having some kind of steering. Of course, you know, exactly what things should go into those guidelines is not something that I would be able to say here. I think that's ongoing work, but I think the platform of the work that the, for example, the Blue Food Assessment is, is conducting, I think off of that, we could start to have those conversations more. Okay. So you mentioned equity and uh, I, I agree with you that it's, it's a very, very important issue. So having uh, that in mind, I'm coming back to you, Enrique, again, and I'm asking, uh, how your study can help these countries that are less privileged in order to achieve these goals. Of course, we need practical and cost-effective solutions, how we can reach some outcomes. Let's say in the next 10 years, let's say in the next decade, can we be positive that something is happening? Well, clearly the status quo is very unequal. Right, because there are clear winners and clear losers. And the philosophy that prevails is the winner takes it all. 
And uh, West Africa is an example of every year over $2 billion are taken away um, in the form of seafood that is not consumed locally, but is consumed in food secure countries like the European Union, United States, or China um, in, in big Chinese cities. Um, I think that, well, our research in other research that, that has been published before dispels the myth very clearly that we cannot protect more because we have to get more fish out of the ocean because we reached peak fish 25 years ago. We cannot get more fish out of the ocean by fishing more. Even the World Bank suggests that if the fishing capacity, the fishing effort was cut by about half, the global fisheries catch would increase and the Absolutely. economic benefit would increase too, right? The problem is that you know, subst um, perpetuating that overcapacity in, fi in industrial fisheries is just is going to continue the, the depletion of marine life. And, and except for a few, again, a few fisheries in a few countries that are doing it well and, 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 based, and based in science. And I'm looking at, at, at Norway here. So um, I think we have a, we're seeing something similar that we saw with tobacco or with, with climate change, that we have to um, dispel these myths because the science is very clear, right? Um, yeah. And I think it also would be, um, uh, dangerous to say, oh, we need to replace all the meat that we eat with, with fish. Because um, especially in food secure countries, we can get the micronutrients and the proteins we need from plants. That's very clear, right? So replacing the, the excessive amounts of meat that are consumed in the global north with seafood would be, um, would reduce the amount of uh, greenhouse gases emitted and, and the land destruction emitted by livestock industry on the land. But also our research also shows that the CO2 emissions from bottom trolling, for example, are larger than most countries' national, national emissions, right? So we cannot look at uses of the ocean in silos. We cannot look at just proteins because you know we need to look at the larger environmental impacts. So a way to do that, instead of incentives, I would, um, yeah, I, reducing, eliminating the subsidies that perpetuate um, over exploitation, that would be a great, great way to start. Yeah, it's a good point. It's very difficult, though. I can say to you from my own experience, eliminating subsidies from the European funds was a very, very difficult task also for me myself. So since you mentioned China, I have one last question from Vidar, for Vidar, and then perhaps we can turn to Henrik to, see, to receive some questions from the people who are attending. So. How do we, do we have any ideas? I'm also thinking about that, and I think it's at the top of the mind of all of, my, of all of us, how we can bring these big players on the table that are not so present here, and I mean China, Russia, or India. So we have all these regional bodies that you advised for, and I totally agree with you. We have UN and international fora, but what is happening with these, how can I say, big countries that can play a very, very important role? Yeah. Well, I, some, some countries have big ocean territories, uh, but do not see themselves uh, culturally, historically, mentally as ocean states. Um, and Indian yeah. told me once, we're a big ocean state, but we have our backs turned against the ocean. Uh, so um, I think the the need to understand the importance of the ocean also for the land-based economy and for human life as such is, uh, is a big need and uh, we need to work on that. Um, but we do see increasing attention also in countries like India and China on the role of the ocean. They're both countries that have, I am aware, approached my home country, Norway, in order to learn more about integrated ocean management um, because they do see these complexities of managing uh, the ocean seriously. Uh, and since you mentioned Russia, uh, that's actually a quite interesting example in the high north. Norway and Russia have had joint fisheries management throughout ups and downs in the bilateral and geopolitical mm -hmm. context since the 70s. Yeah, and why know. has that, so that succeeded? Because it's been based on scientific data. So. Uh, that's an interesting example, again, of the importance of basing policy and international collaboration on scientific data. Okay. So, Henry, do you have some questions? Yes, Coming I do. from uh, the audience. I mean, yeah. Quite a few questions actually are coming in uh, from the audience, and I will read uh, three of them out. 
and then uh, I will invite uh, the most suitable individuals to to respond to them. Just three that I that I chose. One is uh, about uh, well, two of them are about protected areas. Actually, a lot of questions on that. Uh, so, how can we then convince governments and locals that full no-take MPAs are needed to mitigate climate change and increase sustainable food? So, this is the question, and my follow-up is like, what? Why doesn't it work when you have all these arguments, Enrique? Is my question. And similarly, another question is more on the short versus the long term, also related to um, protected areas. Um, the question is, on the temporal dimension of no-take zones, how can we deal with the immediate losses to fishers and make benefits attainable within a few years? So how do we transition in, uh, is, is my own addition. And then uh, uh, finally, another question that's more general related to the summit uh, is, uh, the knowledge gap between developed and developing countries in science and science policy interface is critical towards a thriving ocean. In which ways is the Nobel Prize Summit working to narrow this gap towards a thriving ocean? Oh, this so, is great. So let's take the first questions, the first two questions on marine protected areas. I, hmm. I think Enrique can uh, uh, give us more and then perhaps Selke can add something referring to the change of behavior. Please, Enrique. So the first one is the main roadblock is the perceived conflict between extraction and protection, right? Um, it, and it's this zero sum game of the ocean that has been absolutely. the problem. Absolutely. So, I mean, the science is very clear and we have examples from all over the world. Also going to the second question that if we fully protect areas, a fraction of, of uh, fishing grounds that generates benefits to the local communities pretty quickly in some areas like in Kenya or in Fiji, for example, within three years, uh, the catch of uh, scallops and clams or the uh, increase that by seven times, the income of fishermen doubled in only three years in, in, in Mombasa and Kenya after the creation of a protected area. Um, and in some cases it will require longer time, right? But this is not something that happens just with fishing. It happens with, with everything. There is some um, transition time, and we need to provide bridge financing for this because the economic studies that Rashid was mentioning are very clear that in the long term, the economic benefits to all are much greater with protection than continuing with overexploitation. So we need to figure out, instead of propping up overexploitation, we, we need to redirect some of this uh, funding to uh, do the to provide the bridge transition, and again, we are not talking about people stopping what they are doing. We're talking about setting aside areas, some areas, part of their use areas, right, while um, helping to manage sustainably the rest. So I can confirm totally what you said from my own experience. The only way to promote a new fisheries policy in the European Union some years ago was to finance a bridge for the transitional period, because this can create a, a feeling of safety between the people, the stakeholders, and this helped us a lot. But LK, can you help us on that? Can you give us some advice how we can overcome the obstacles from the decision makers on that, the reluctance? Absolutely, and, and I think sort of Enric's point is, is spot on, immediate benefits and, 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 and easing the transition. But I think in the, there are lots of examples where uh, enlightened government sometimes just has to break uh, a, a, a status quo that is against public welfare by saying, uh, look, we've done the analysis, uh, you know, this, this, this is better, like a carbon tax, for example, in, in British Columbia, I think in 2008 was one, one of the early ones. Uh, the, the, the provincial government said, you know, sort of, we're going to do this. There was a huge public outcry against this. And I think sort of that, yeah, I could easily give you four or five theories about why the public doesn't like change. You know, oftentimes change that sort of everybody admits it's some level is, is, is desirable, but people don't like change, period. Uh, but if somebody comes in and changes uh, the, you know, the, 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 the desired things to this hated new thing, uh, after a while, the, 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 the hated new thing will become the law of the land and will become uh, the, you know, the, the, the new status quo. And people will sort of basically adapt to that and then query its advantages first. 
and 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 also experiencing benefits of that. You know, if it is indeed in increasing public welfare, people will experience that, and so you have to want to make sure that the uh, benefits become immediately available you know, as, as as much as possible. Publicize those. But the question is, how long is that transition period between sort of an opposition because it's no longer the status quo and becoming used to it and seeing the advantages? And it seems turns out in British Columbia, it was less than it was less than uh, fourteen months. Yeah, uh, if you look at public opinion uh, sentiment ratings in, 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 in the newspapers that report on that. Uh, public opinion goes south at time of announcement of this carbon tax. It bottoms out in the negative domain uh, in, at, at time of implementation. And then 14 months later, it becomes net positive. Now it's being touted as sort of the poster child for how carbon taxes get implemented because you know, it was revenue neutral. You know, so the, the public you know, was, it was refunded to the public every six months or so. Uh, similarly, the, a, 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 a ban on smoking in public places that I think Mayor Bloomberg at the time, maybe in 2004, implemented huge public outcry against that. Yeah, he said, look, uh, my done analysis, it increases public welfare, public health. Uh, I'm going to do this anyway. You don't have to reelect me. I'm rich. Uh, he implemented it. Yeah, public opinion went south, bottomed out. In this case, it was less than 12 months. It was nine months before it became net positive. Yeah, and so public opinion will be against change, but public opinion is not written in stone. And if 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 certain policies do, you know, improve public welfare and it's made noticeable as, as much as possible, public will come around and it is within the re-election cycle of public officials, even in the Western countries. So I think sort of these kinds of results should, you know, should sort of provide policymakers, you know, with some confidence that sometimes you should not be guided by public opinion, but you should lead public opinion. Well, this is a great, great truth, great truth. Okay, that's why we need some political ambition here. Okay, so Vidar can uh, help us with the other question about the Nobel Summit and how it can help. Well, I think the, the Nobel Summit, uh, which is first in, uh, in history, is uh, wow. a way of mobilizing uh, Nobel laureates and other experts across a wide array of fields uh, coming together to address a complex but very urgent challenge and leading discussions with um, policymakers, activists, journalists. Um, and out of that, I think, will and hope will come an understanding that uh, for the world to find solutions at scale and speed, uh, you need to listen to science. Uh, but more than that, you need to act on uh, science, even if the short term, in the short term, uh, changes uh, may be unpopular. Uh, I think what Elke just said is incredibly important, and the difference is often made up of political leadership. So scientists, even Nobel laureates, can't change the world, but they can contribute to giving the insights that politicians need to take forward to make the necessary changes. But there was a question if uh, there is a, an opportunity for the Nobel Foundation to help bridging the differences between uh, the most vulnerable countries that don't have the capacity for marine protection, for other uh, conservation acts. I mean, and, I mean, I can understand this gap and uh, I know there is not a perfect solution. Perhaps sometimes, Vida, I'm thinking that we have to think all of us together about a possible fund that can be more effective in financing these actions. And also we can uh, perhaps, uh, Rashid mentioned that there will be some um, uh, innovative tools, financial tools, insurance tools, blue bonds and things like that from the banks that can help. But uh, is, uh, there will be a discussion around that, how the countries, the less vulnerable in the summit, there will be a discussion about how the, less the more vulnerable countries can uh, speed up in a way on this? Well, there's certainly uh, discussions at the summit on uh, the economic dimensions and the economic requirements including on the role of uh, international assistance for achieving the SDGs, for example. That's not something that the Nobel Foundation, where the Nobel Foundation is an actor, we're providing a platform here, but uh, um, these discussions will have people taking part that are certainly key to finding these solutions. 
Okay. So the time is uh, going to an end. So I would like uh, to have a last question for all of you. Okay, let's think of the 2021. Let's think of the year that is ahead of us. There are a lot of ambitions to have it as a year of the oceans. So what is your greatest expectation? I'm referring to all of you from this year. What it can bring to ocean conservation world that can make you really happy? What will be something that <laughs> will cheer you up the most? So there are a lot of targets, a lot of initiatives, a lot of goals. We have to do this, we have to do that. Marine protection, climate, seafood, subsidies, uh, illegal fishing, so many tasks. So, and of course, uh, Paris Agreement, whatever. What, what do you think it is the most, most important? What will make you happy? Let me start from whom? From Beatrice, perhaps. Beatrice, what will make you happy about Blue Food? I think that I would be really happy uh, in 2021 in September, as you know, we have the, the first ever food summit uh, or summit. Yeah, and I think. I heard of that. Yeah, and I think for me, uh, I would be happy, and I think everyone working on the Blue Foods assessment would be happy. And, and if Blue Foods were at the heart of that food debate, so that we can take a holistic perspective on what uh, a sustainable food future is and to, to you know, as, as Enrique was saying earlier, which is what I was trying to allude to in my presentation, that aquatic foods uh, are going to play an important role, but they will not be like the, the solution. And maybe some of us have to leapfrog, you know, nutritionally secure countries will have to leapfrog over to much more plant-based and not looking to just replace our terrestrial protein with, with seafood. And I think if we can have that holistic conversation about where the blue foods at the heart of foods as a whole and what that means for um, how we you know, conduct seafood production in a sustainable way so that we also have you know, all the other benefits that we need from the oceans, then I would be really happy. Okay. So let me turn it to Eric now. Okay, three things. One, at the COP15 of, of the Convention on Biodiversity, the world agrees to protect at least 30% of our land and ocean by 2030. Two, at the COP26, there is agreement that the ocean is not seen as a, as a victim anymore of climate change, but as a solution to, and ocean actions can be included within the national determined contributions. And three, countries, uh, low-income countries have incurred enormous amounts of debt during the pandemic to solve short-term issues. So I would hope that donor countries would show the generosity and the humanity to ease that debt. So those countries um, can worry less about the short term immediate uh, financial needs and invest in the long term uh, wealth and, and health of their citizens. So part of that debt should be forgiven and uh, invested in the green blue recovery for these countries, which is in the longer term more beneficial. Absolutely, good points. Elke, what about you? So first of all, I endorse yeah, sort of all the concrete suggestions that have been put on the table, but I can maybe sort of take a somewhat uh, broader perspective uh, and uh, hope for more cooperation between sort of different uh, problem domains that we're, uh, or solution domains that we're talking about. Yeah, sort of, uh, we, we, we all are focusing on our pet uh, cars, yeah, the ocean here, my cost tends to be climate change. Uh, and, and for people who are so concerned about the fact that needs to that there needs to be cooperation when it comes to our own cost, we still are competing between each other. Uh, and, and while at the same time, I think sort of many, many solutions have win-win consequences across different areas. So I think sort of seeing more cooperation uh, across areas or also across partners, yeah, and, and, and thinking more about sort of win-win solutions and, and, and finding ways of bridging between our silos, you know, that, that are clearly useful because you need to have a silo, you need to be dedicated to async to get things done. But every once in a while, we also have to step back and think about, okay, how can we combine forces you know, in, 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 in ways that, 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 that get both of us ahead rather than competing for, for, for scarce resources or for scarce attention. Okay, great. Vidar, last but not least. Well, it's hard to add anything to uh, these uh, suggestions, but... Uh... I would, would say that um, if we could learn from uh, the best examples, and there are quite a lot 
of how countries have managed the pandemic, how they've been acting between or acting on knowledge, uh, close interaction between uh, science and politics, economic life, how configurations of health, uh, economy, fundamental freedoms, international cooperation, how these things have been brought together and with an incredibly short time horizon led to much better results than we could have feared um, in many countries. I think if we could learn from that uh, on the crisis of nature, ocean and terrestrial, uh, that would be something um, important going forward. Great. Okay, guys. So I think we are approaching to the end. I would like to thank you all for being in this discussion. It really was an honor for me to coordinate and uh, to discuss with all of you. I think uh, we have um, um, some very important points were emerged from our discussion. I would like just to repeat some that Enrique already mentioned before. So uh, Eric, sorry, Eric mentioned before as when he summarized our discussion. So first we can all see ocean as a solution. There are solutions around the ocean. We have to think in a positive way and uh, it's important to move forward and uh, see what we can do best about it. The second point I would like to mention is that uh, we need to promote the protection of ocean and especially marine protected areas can be a great, great tool going forward if they are designed and preserved well. And uh, we can win the triple, as Eric uh, Salah mentioned. We can have ocean protection and biodiversity, climate change, and more food production, which is great. This triple can create a win-win-win solution that can be a great incentive for all of us. Then there was a discussion around uh, the blue food, the food from the ocean, I think we have to have in mind that choosing, making our choices, where we have to think on a with a holistic way, holistic approach, having in mind not only us and the way we consume, but also the greater impact of the production of blue food, the impact to the environment, also the impact to other countries and having the global approach and equity issues that arise. And about how we are going to move on, I think that uh, there were some important, uh, uh, so, uh, important conclusions. I think that everybody agreed that uh, science is absolutely basic to make good decisions, good science, good knowledge, also a lesson from a pandemic. I take what Vidar uh, said lastly, that some countries have already good uh, uh, experience from the pandemic, so we can use the science-based methods referring to ocean conservation and exploitation. Um, we have to do the investment in the right way, having in mind sustainability. I think that Rashid mentioned a lot around that. And uh, all these ideas about how a blue investment can be productive, one dollar can give uh, five dollars under conditions can create a great uh, motive and incentive for investors. Having that in mind, uh, we have uh, to think how we can enable financial, new financial mechanisms, uh, partnering with banks, with insurance companies, with uh, others to do that. Then there was also an idea about partnering public and private money in a virtuous way, how we can use them to support win-win uh, solutions and not subsidize sectors just for our, how can I say, political, I'm referring to the political leaders now, for our political interest. And this is uh, very, very important, having in mind the WTO negotiations this year. So to make a long story short, there were a lot of great proposals for, the, for this year for the coming big meetings, the coming biodiversity meeting, the Glasgow meeting, the WTO negotiations, and the High Seas Treaty. Perhaps we didn't discuss a lot about High Seas, but as Rashid mentioned, uh, 
54% of the fisheries in high seas are subsidized. So, and they are in advantage of, let's say 10 countries around the world. So, so only this, if you have in mind, can find a solution. Last but not least, there were some discussion. There was some discussion about how we can bridge the gap between the small countries that have less capacity and the strong uh, mechanisms that are there from other countries or uh, international bodies. And I hope that some solutions will emerge soon. So to make a long story short, this was a fruitful discussion, at least in my opinion. And I would like to thank you all to thank our host, the Nobel Foundation and Vidar for having all that, and uh, to wish the best success for Nobel Summit in August. Thank you all very much. <laughs>